Well, great to see you. Jesus is amazing, isn't he? I mean, that's the talk, really, all done. Um, there are so many different ways we could look at Jesus being amazing. Because Jesus is the organizing principle for the universe. He's not an exception. He actually makes the pattern. Everything he can explain. Think about his life, his documented life, even if we were to ignore Christian sources. We could already see that he died being killed by the Romans, based on Roman and Jewish sources. That he died on the eve of Passover, that time when the Jews, that remarkable people group, celebrate their greatest deliverance. And it's an interesting thing that the climactic scene in the Gospels is, of course, Christ on a cross. That's the picture you go away with. But then there's scriptures before the New Testament, the Old Testament. Go to any Jewish synagogue, and those are the books they have. And what's the opening scene in those books? Well, in Genesis 3, there is this story at a tree where humans take a fruit and death comes into the world. And it's like the beginning of a story. And you say, well, how is that story going to be resolved? And you go through the Jewish scriptures, and at no point is it resolved. So it's remarkable already that Jesus' own biography answers so amazingly to this amazing lot of literature that this remarkable people group have. And that's just looking at one thing. And of course, his body disappears and lots of people say they've seen him resurrected, which is not something that Jews thought could happen to one person, and yet it happens to Jesus. And then he has this remarkable genealogy, and there are all sorts of aspects of his life that seem prefigured in the books that come before him. And he has this integrity when people look at how he treats women in the Gospels. It's remarkable when you look at that compared with what was going on in the culture around him. All sorts of different ways. And I want to look at something about Jesus, which I don't think is the most remarkable thing, because it's hard to say what the most remarkable thing is. It's an amazing, remarkable area, which is his storytelling. But before that, I want to talk about his memes. Um, did you, I mean, Jesus has all these amazing memes. We might, or, or just amazing sayings. Now, I quite like Churchill. I know he did some bad stuff. Okay, I, I quite like Churchill because he comes out with some you know, really quite clever things, quite witty, but they're not use, that useful. Like, we will fight them on the beaches. Is that any use to you today? Like, who are you going to fight on the beaches? Is there anyone even to fight on the beaches? I don't think so. So, not very useful. What Jesus comes out with, just in a brief 12-minute block of teaching, Matthew 5 through to 7, everything from blessed are the peacemakers, to if someone strikes you one cheek, turn the other, to love your enemies. Now, did Jesus actually say that? Well, if he didn't, he has to go inside with some people who create amazing memes and put them on his lips, right? And so one aspect of Jesus is not just his own personal story of his life, death, and resurrection, but the embedded story of the things he says. People might dis uh, debate his miracles, more miracles attributed to Jesus than to anyone else. And I think there's good evidence for those miracles. But it's the fact that you have the genealogy, the biography, the sayings, the stories, the miracles, all happening together at this person who happens to die at this very remarkably symbolic time. And you think, how do you get all that coming together? But as we just keep going through the Sermon on the Mount, you realize it's not just that. He says things like, judge not that you be not judged. Whatever measure you use on someone else is going to be used back on you. That's something like everyday wisdom. There's no politician who comes out with a series of such useful and amazing and insightful things. Because to simplify things, you need to understand them really well. And Jesus has such perfect understanding of everything that he can simplify things. And he says, you're looking at the speck in your brother's eye and you're forgetting there's a bigger object, a beam in your own eye. Or what about this in Matthew chapter 7? Do unto others what you'd have them do to you. 
That's now called the golden rule. The first person to come up with that positive golden rule is Jesus Christ. All of those things to come together. And you might say, well, you know, maybe Matthew was a genius who came up with that. That won't explain why I've got the truth will set you free over in John. I mean, just to come up with one idea like the truth will set you free, that should earn you a place in history books because it's so applicable to so many different situations. Or a kingdom divided against itself cannot stand. Or whoever lives by the sword will die by the sword. Or the poor you will always have with you, which is a remarkable comment on human nature, is it not? All of these things that are said by Jesus. And then the stories. Think about the story of the Good Samaritan, something of, of reaching across ethnic boundaries. Yes, this is the same person who says, love your enemies, tells stories about how to do that. And that leads to the founding of charities. All those amazing ideas. And what I want us to do today is look at his longest story. And you know how long his longest story is? Three minutes long. Wow. And it's how much someone can do in three minutes. Because a lot of storytellers, you know, liked it to go on for a long time. And Jesus does this absolutely amazing story, which is on the handout. We're going to look at it in Luke chapter 15. And we're going to begin with a bit of the context. So the context is this at the beginning, Luke 15, verses 1 through to 3. Now all the tax collectors and sinners were drawing near to hear him, and the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling, saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. And he told them this parable, saying, notice we have four groups of people. We have tax collectors. Yes, they're people who take your money. Uh, you're about to donate to the temple and give it to the Romans. So they're going to pay your oppressors. Not, you don't really like them. Um, and uh, you don't expect tax collectors to know much about the Bible because they're, they're selling their souls for money. OK? And then you've got sinners. Well, everyone's a sinner. But like, these are really special sinners. That's their identity. That's how they're like, getting seen by everyone. You don't expect them to be interested in the Bible. Then you've got their polar opposite, the good guys, the Pharisees. Remember, Pharisees are good guys, OK? Pharisees spend their time separating from sin, spending all their time trying to get away from sin. They're exactly the opposite. And they study the scriptures really hard. And then there are scribes. They spend their time copying out the scriptures by hand. So they know them really well. So Jesus tells a story which actually works to two sort of groups of people. People who don't know the Bible at all. You can read this story. It makes complete sense if you don't know the Bible. And to people who know the Bible the best ever, super well, better than anyone in our culture knows it. And he does that simultaneously like a Pixar movie, where there are things for the parents and grandparents who are watching with the kids that the kids aren't going to get. And Jesus is able to tell a story in that way. But it actually tells three stories. He tells a story first of one out of a hundred sheep lost. The shepherd goes after it, finds it, brings it back, and rejoices. Then is a story of one out of ten coins lost, which a woman lights a lamp, uh, finds the coin, and rejoices. And in each case, they bring together their friends and neighbors for a big celebration. Then it's a story of two sons. First 62% is about the younger son. Final 38% about the older son. Now, what's interesting is that Jesus uses Sudoku principles in this because he has a story of a sheep going away from home and it's found and there's rejoicing. Then he has a story of a coin lost at home and there's found and there's rejoicing. Then he has a story of a son who goes away from home and he comes back and he's found and there's rejoicing. And then you have the story of a son at home and then a missing ending. The missing ending of how does this older brother respond? You don't know. It doesn't tell you because you're meant to fill in the ending using Sudoku. If he were to come in, you know there would be rejoicing. That's a really powerful thing in storytelling, to do something by missing something out. And we'll see Jesus does that in other ways. You start with, what is it? 1% of the sheep lost, 10% of the coins lost. What's the next percentage? Maybe 100. Again, you fill in the numbers and you realize both of these older sons, oh, these sons are lost. And I'm going to pick up the story in uh, their in verse 11, Jesus said, a certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, Dad, 
give me the share of property that's coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Don't ever forget that word, them. It's not gave it to him, he gives it to both. This is a generous dad who is, not, he's not gonna give it to one son and not to the other, he gives it to both. What country does a story take place in? We don't know, because it's a story. But if it took place under Old Testament law, the oldest brother gets double what the younger brother gets. And then if you think about a traditional family uh, with, with a farm, actually, usually the oldest brother gets all of the actual real estate and just the younger son gets the movable stuff. So we know the older brother does really well out of this. So he should be so glad. Little bro, I love you so much. I'm so glad you asked dad for the inheritance. I've got the jackpot. Thank you, little brother. I love you so much. Oh. If ever you need me, I'm gonna be there for you. I am your lifelong debtor. I'm so glad, I love you. And if you ever go away, I'm gonna miss you so much. Maybe that's how the story ought to have gone if the older son had done the right thing, but it's not quite how it goes, is it? As you know. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country. And we're gonna notice how the words near and far are used. And there he squandered his property, living dissolutely. Now, when people retell the story or make a film of this, that's the bit they make into the whole big central section. Jesus does all the sin with one word, dissolutely, one word. Like, he doesn't spin that out because if you spin it out, you're glorifying sin you're particularizing sin because you're sex particular ones, and sin's really boring. You're never better off after hearing a story of sin. Jesus is too good a storyteller to make that into the big central section. So we're actually gonna move on from that really quickly. And when he had spent everything, there arose a severe famine in that country and he began to be in need. Now notice, when people think of this story, they call it the story of the prodigal son. More accurately, it's the story of the prodigal and unlucky son. Because did you notice the great famine? A lot of the time when people tell this story in a Western context, people miss out the fact that there is a famine in this story. There didn't need to be, but there is. We never get to see what would happen to the younger brother if there were no famine. So we might say, why in a moment is he gonna be feeding pigs? And we say, because he made a lot of bad decisions. Well, that's part of the answer. He's also because he happened to be unlucky enough to choose to go to the one country that was hit by a big famine. And you see how Jesus' story slightly lets him off the hook. We might judge his situation and say, you know why he's in that mess? You know why that other person over there is in that mess? Because they made a ton of bad decisions. And forget the fact that the reason we're in a better situation is because of Luck, I mean, I'm not using luck in a theological way. You understand? We've just been dealt a better hand in life. So here he is, the prodigal and unlucky son. And so it says, so he went and attached himself, that's no pay, to one of the citizens of that country. And he sent him into his fields to feed pigs. Here we see amazing things about Jesus's vocabulary choice. He attached himself, implying no pay to one of the citizens, ooh, that's a painful term, it rubs in that he's not a citizen, he doesn't belong, who sent him into his fields, the plural, just showing you how rich this guy is, and then he ends up feeding pigs. Now, herding animals is the lowest thing to do. Herding unclean animals is really bad. Now, think about it. There's also in this story emotional intelligence, because not only does Jesus tell a story in which there is no um, lean uh, uh, there's, there's, there's no excess fat, fat here. It's a very lean story. Every single word counts. It's doing something. That's amazing. And by the way, that shows it all comes from him. Not just, it's not that a genius starts the story going and other editors sort of add bits on. That's not going to get you a really great work of art. It's this, that if you're a Pharisee and you're listening, you're thinking this story is going really well right now because this younger son is getting what he deserves, feeding pigs. So Jesus gets the Pharisees on the side before this story is gonna turn around and become a lot more uncomfortable for them. And it says, and he was longing to be filmed with the pods that the pigs ate and no one was giving out anything. He is in a situation where he's not even getting pig reject food 
And if you eat nothing, what happens to you? You die. And so it's only when he's on that path towards dying that he's going to wake up. And what we see is this. Verse 17, having come to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I am perishing here with hunger. I will arise and go to my father and say to him, father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. Here we are given inside the guy's head, a speech of self-address. And what's the word that comes out three times in this speech? It's the word father. Notice how every time he talks to his father, the very first word from his mouth is father. Whether it's the speech he gives to ask for something at the beginning, whether it's the speech he rehearses in his head, or the speech he's about to give when he actually gets back. And so he realizes his father is generous. His father pays the hired servants more than the going rate. They've got more than they need. He would be better off if he were a servant. And so he goes back to his father, verse 20, having arisen, go to his father. While he's still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. Now, what's so interesting here is how Jesus does things as a storyteller without telling you them. So, for instance, he never tells you this is a farm, but by the end of the story, you're absolutely convinced it's a farm, right? He never tells you the father was a generous person, but by the end of the story, you're really convinced the father's a generous person. And here, he tells you the father saw him. Was it just chance? He just happened to look out at that one moment when the son was in the distance. Of course it wasn't. You put it together and you realize it's probably because he's looking out an awful lot that he's the first person. Were there other people who could have spotted him? Yes, the older brother. And it seems there are lots of people working around here, hired servants, loads of people. All sorts of people could have seen him first. What are the chances that it's dad? Well, the chances are a lot bigger if dad is always looking out. And it says he felt compassion. You expect him to feel anger. I mean, after all, this son went away from home. He's wasted everything he had, and he feels compassion. And then he runs, and yet we seem to know that this father has been old because all these years have passed. And he runs and he embraces and he kisses him. That's just amazing. And then the son says to him, what's the first word out of his mouth? Verse 21, father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. And then he doesn't get to finish his speech. Why doesn't he get to finish his speech? Well, we are going to have to do some work. So Jesus is a good storyteller. He makes his audience do some work. And so we're going to have to think, what are the possibilities? Well, the most likely possibility seems to be this. That the father, verse 22, says to his servants, quick, that's the first word from his mouth, bring the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring the fattened calf and kill it and let's eat and celebrate for this. My son was dead and is alive again, who is lost and is found. The father is in a rush. How has time passed while the son's been away? Really slowly. And now suddenly there's a rush. The father, by the way, never talks to the younger son, does he? He talks to the servant. Now, storyteller is so good, he doesn't need to tell you that servants are there. He doesn't say, and then the servants arrived, and he said, quick. No, it just rushes on. He says to the servants, quick, bring the fattened calf and, and, and bring out the best robe and, and so on. Let's eat and celebrate. But notice this. It seems that the father has interrupted the son. But again, the storyteller's too good to tell you, and the father interrupted the son. It doesn't slow down for a moment. Do you see how every single word is doing its work? And he says, let's bring the fattened calf, eat and celebrate. For this, my son was dead and alive again, lost and found. You're going to have those words come back again in verse 32, but with a difference, because it's this, your brother was dead and alive again, lost and found. So it's like the story is divided into these two different sections. Then we go to verse 25. Now the older brother was in the field. What was he doing in the field? Storyteller doesn't tell us. But we sort of work out, he's working. He's working late. He's working at a time when others are partying. Left his cell phone behind. No, no, you know, no one's there, but told him the party's going on. He's working so hard. Whose farm is he working on? His own. He owns this thing. Yeah? And when he'd come, he drew near to the house and he heard the music and dancing. And he called one of the lads and asked what these things meant. And this is amazing, verse 27, people often miss it. The fact that this, whether it's a boy or a servant, we don't know, 
uh, in verse 27, replies with not a hint of emotion. And he said to him, your brother has come and your father has killed the fattened, cu fattened calf because he's received him back in good health. It's entirely factual. Contrast what dad says. He was dead and alive again with the servant. He has received him back in good health. That is why they have killed the animal. You see? And then the ability to switch emotions on and off, because the very next verse, emotions are going to come back. But he was angry. He was not willing to go in. His father came out and entreated him. And he answered his father, missing word. Look. What's the missing word? Younger son always called him father. He says, look, for all these years I've slaved for you. I've never disobeyed your command. Hang on. You're in charge of the farm. You never gave me a young goat. He gave me every goat, every goat on the farm that I might celebrate with my friends. In other words, I want to celebrate away from you. But when this son of yours came, de denying uh, siblinghood, who has devoured your livelihood with prostitutes, how do you know? You're just back in from the field. He's never written postcards from the brothel. You killed the fattened calf for him. No, it's for all of us. And he said, child, you're always with me, and all my things are yours. That's literally true. But it was necessary to celebrate and be glad for this. Your brother was dead and alive again, lost and found. Now, that's amazing. And that's just the surface. Because as Jesus tells this story, he has all these layers of reference to Genesis. A man had two sons. Reminds you of Adam had two sons. And you have the older son, Cain, envious at the acceptance of the younger son. Go to Genesis 4. You see how the archetype is all there. A man had two sons. Reminds you of how Abraham had two sons, doesn't it? And yet Abraham's the only other guy who gives away his inheritance while he's still alive. Genesis 25. And He's the first man in the Bible to run. And what's the first thing he says when he runs? He says, quick. And then he goes and gets a fatted calf. It's all there in Genesis 18. And he doesn't give his inheritance equally to the two sons because the older son, Ishmael, despises the feast for the younger son, Genesis 21. And so he is cast out of inheritance. And then we have a man had two sons. Who's the most famous man to have two and only two sons? That would be Isaac. And Isaac's older son, Esau, is cheated out of the inheritance by the younger son who goes off to a far country, feeds animals, comes back. And what happens when he comes back? It says, Genesis 33, verse 4, that Esau ran, fell on his neck and kissed him. It's the only time in the entire Bible that phrase occurs. And it's part of the scribal training of the time of Jesus to know that verse particularly well. I can demonstrate. So Jesus makes the dramatic high point of the story fit with the high point of their syllabus. And then, of course, it's not just that story. It's the story of Joseph, who suddenly gets a ring and a robe on his hand. A ring on his hand and a robe. Who's at a great time of famine? The son who's dead and then alive again? That would be Joseph. And who, where else in the Bible do you get friend, goat, and prostitute together? like we get in this story. Oh, that would be Genesis 38, the story of Judah. The, the man from whom the Jews derive their name, who is sexually misbehaving in the land while his brother Joseph is sexually behaving, resisting Mrs. Potiphar in a far country. And who suddenly gets angry? All these years I've been slaving for you. That's Jacob to Laban. Basically, Jesus uses all of Genesis's greatest hits, Genesis four hours long, into this three minute story in such a way that the story works if you don't know any of Genesis. And if you do, it hits you time and time again. You've seen Abraham's generosity. You see, even bad old Esau forgives, having been ripped out of everything. It's all there. That's genius. And so there's someone who told that story also has their own life story that they gave themselves for us and rose again. And it all fits together. You say, Jesus is amazing. Thank you. Hey, what's going on everyone? Alonzo here from the AUCA, the Oxford Center for Christian Apologetics. Behind me, I have a bunch of our team. We are making some content right now. Hey, we can only do this sort of work because of generous people like yourselves. You like things, you subscribe, you share, you follow, and you prayerfully and financially support us. We literally could not do this without you. So we just all wanted to say thank you. 
Thank you for making this all possible to reach people with the good news of Jesus. Now, if you want to see more of this, you can check out our website, theaka.org. We are putting new content up there all the time. We try to mix it up and do really cool things, but we just wanted to say thank you so much. Go to the website for more fresh new content, and we'll see you next time. Thank you again. Peace.